Welcome, I'm Bob White, a neonatologist from South Bend, Indiana. I've been interested for years in the physical environment, the sensory environment of newborns and their families and their caregivers in the newborn intensive care unit. This presentation is about the sensory environment of the newborn ICU and the implications that that has for newborn ICU design. The NICU design matters for lots of reasons, most importantly to babies, of course. For babies, this is an absolutely crucial period of brain growth and development, unlike any other time in life. For families, those of us who work in newborn ICUs know this inherently, that this is a time of crisis for them. They examine their relationships with each other, their relationships with God, and of course, their relationship with the baby. And this time in the newborn intensive care unit is a time when families are built or sometimes are torn apart. And for us, this is a defining part of our life. For many of us, where we work is a big part of who we are. So the design matters. The space in which we work and live is an important aspect of how well we do our jobs. So we'll start with these premises. First, that babies deserve the best available treatment. Second, that we should not separate babies and parents um, because of our policies or because of an inappropriate design. Our commitment to babies and their families should be as great as to any other patients in the hospital because the importance of them to our society is just as great. And the stakes in the brain development, in the growth and development of other parts of the body is as great or greater as anywhere else in the hospital. And finally, that the NICU environment should meet the needs of the people who are there. It, it shouldn't be designed simply as a space in which we do what we do, but as one which nurtures and fosters us to do it the best way possible. So here's a slide that demonstrates something that I think we all know, but a, a visual is really helpful. In the time that we have a baby who is born at 26 weeks until term, the brain growth and development increases exponentially by 400%. In that three month period, the brain growth and development occurs at a pace that is unmatched any other time in life. When a baby is born at term, from that point until adulthood, their brain grows by 400%. That's in a whole childhood. But that same proportion of 400% happens in three months time while babies are with us. And here's what's happening during that time. This is what has been termed the synaptic big bang by Jean-Pierre Bourgeois, who um, wrote an article and, and illustrated it with this slide. So the trimesters are roughly shown here as phase one, two, and three. They're described as phases rather than trimesters because most of this work has been done in animals. Um, but during phase one and phase two, the early stages of pregnancy, there's not much synaptic formation going on in the brain, but when you hit the third trimester, you see this exponential rise, and this continues through the time of term and on into the first few months after uh, term delivery. Then during childhood, it stays at this very high level, um, only starting to decline in quantity during puberty, and then during adult life continues, of course, but at a lower rate than at any other time in childhood. But this big bang is going on again while those kids are with us in the newborn intensive care unit. And this is where those synapses are being formed. On the left side, you see where uh, the major synaptic connections are going on in adults. And these parts of the brain are in the brain that allow us to associate information and information processing. Whereas in the newborn, it's all happening with the senses, visual, auditory, sensory motor. That's what's going on with all the synaptic connections in the third trimester and in the first few months after birth. So here's some common myths about infant brains. And I think we kind of inherently understand these now, but I'm not sure that we behave as though we know that these aren't true anymore. For example, the idea that the brain is a blank slate Babies learn a great deal. A lot of sensory development is already occurring in utero. And yet, sometimes I think we don't treat kids as though there already is great capability of their brains. We think of 
babies as being extraordinarily resilient, and indeed they are. But this is not unlimited. And certainly adverse events happening during the time they're in the newborn intensive care unit can have serious long-term consequences. We think of babies as being at rest during sleep, and certainly that is the case for kids and adults, that during sleep memory is consolidated and things that we learn during the day becomes uh, firmed up in our brain. But in fact, in newborns, learning even continues during the time of sleep. And I'll show you a study in a short time that um, has documented this learning occurring essentially 24 hours a day for newborns. We think babies, we used to think, babies were too young to learn and to habituate and, and to become sensitized to stimuli. And certainly in our care, um, we don't always take into account that, that these are things that babies can learn for better or worse about with the care that we're giving them because they don't remember that later on in life. And yet it has been shown well that uh, babies do habituate and get sensitized to stimuli, again, for better or for worse, whether it's adverse or positive stimuli, babies learn about that under our care. So here's the thing to remember that kind of uh, helps us understand why babies depend so much on human contact. We are altricial mammals. There are um, precocial mammals who are goats, horses, often most of the hooved mammals, who are able to walk around and come find their mother or move away from danger immediately after birth. But altricial mammals are not able to do that. They are totally dependent upon their mothers to provide this information, not only for safety and nutrition, but a, a wealth of biological information that travels hormonally, neurologically between baby and mother in both directions um, for an extended period of time after birth. We were built that way to have this direct, extended, intimate contact with our mothers. All altricial mammals are that way. So when you start to think about kangaroo care as being something that is important for babies, in the past I think we've sometimes just thought, well this is a nice thing for families, it makes mothers feel good and, and maybe the babies will like it too, but not realize the depth of importance to it. And when you compare a baby's time in an incubator to a baby's time in the arms of their mother or father, but especially the mother, because biologically this is where um, the expected environment was going to be, there are dramatic differences in each of the senses. If you go through each one of them, you, you become immediately aware that there is much more information, much more important neurological stimulation happening when the baby is in the arms of its mother than in an incubator. So we like incubators. We, we think they're good places to keep babies, but there are some myths here that I think we need to re-examine. First, the idea that an incubator gives precise and optimal temperature control for babies. Think about why we put babies in incubators at a particular temperature to start with. Back in the 70s, the work was done that showed that babies' survival was better in incubators than in cribs. We, we didn't have warming devices uh, prior to that for babies, and some babies would die uh, because of inadequate temperature control. So the question was asked, so what's the best temperature to keep babies at? And the, the method for determining that was to find what the basal metabolic rate was for babies at the optimal temperature, what was called the thermal neutral environment. Any temperature lower than that or higher than that required more calories for the baby to maintain. And so you have this U-shaped curve and at the bottom of that is what's considered the thermal neutral environment. That's the 36 to 36.5 that we keep babies at in incubators routinely. But when you realize that the most metabolically active organ in the body is the brain, and how important that is at this stage of the baby's life, you have to wonder, maybe having the baby at the body temperature that has the lowest metabolic rate isn't the most desirable. Maybe we want a higher metabolic rate, which 
is conducive to more brain activity. And we know that both in utero and when babies are held skin to skin with their mother, their body temperatures are about a degree higher than this thermal neutral environment. So maybe the temperature environment we've picked for incubators isn't the right one to start with. The other thing about the temperature in incubators is that in utero, babies have an environment that goes through a circadian rhythm. All of our bodies um, change the body temperature by about eight-tenths of a degree Fahrenheit over the course of 24 hours, and babies are exposed to this. But when they are born and we put them in a warmer or an incubator, they couldn't have a circadian rhythm if they tried because we servo control that and keep their temperature constant 24 hours a day. So that's not biologically normal and maybe not even biologically desirable. Our second concept about incubators is that they're an optimal place for infection control. They're a nice, clean place in which we can keep these babies protected. But the fact is that within a few hours of the time a baby is in an incubator, you can culture pathogens from both inside and outside of the incubator. Now it's true that mothers have bacteria on their skin as well, but these, in large part, are probiotics. They are good bacteria. So even in terms of infection control, the incubator is not a better environment than skin to skin with the mother, probably less desirable. And there may be other dangers. Dr. Bellini from uh, Italy has recently shown that there are electromagnetic fields that babies are exposed to because of the uh, electronic equipment in the incubator, particularly for the heater and the uh, fan that circulates the air through the incubator, that babies are exposed to that might be harmful to infants. So in many respects, incubators are not preferable to skin-to-skin -skin care and probably are less desirable. So here are a number of studies that show the benefits of maternal care in the NICU. And I start and I'll end this slide by pointing out that this is just a tiny bit of human data there's a massive amount of data in animals which shows the same. Dr. Cher and his group from Rainbow Babies showed that if you provided skin-to-skin -skin care to babies for just one and a half hours a day, four days a week, so six hours a week for an eight-week period, you could show accelerated signs on EEG of brain maturation. A study from Karolinska which I will discuss in more detail uh, shortly, showed that if you allowed parents to be present 24 hours a day, gave them facilities, the, the space for them to be there with their babies, that you would shorten length of stay and reduce the incidence of chronic lung disease. Dr. Milgram and his group from Norway showed that just training parents about the neurosensory needs of their babies led to improved white matter development when brain scans were done at the time of uh, normal term delivery. Teaching parents infant massage and allowing them to do that for their babies showed improved weight gain according to a Cochrane meta-analysis. Dr. Pfeiffer from New York is the one who showed that infants learned they could habituate or become sensitized to stimuli even when they were asleep. There's a study in pediatrics this last year from Dr. Kasky's group who showed that just exposing babies to vocalization, to talk by their parents, led to them becoming increasingly vocal subsequently. And another Cochrane review showed that kangaroo care was beneficial to babies in a number of respects. So again, this is a, uh, something we already knew from all sorts of animal studies, but we needed to see it in humans, and indeed it is the case. Getting babies together with their mothers has a lot of positive benefits for the babies. So this isn't a new concept. Dr. Robertson and his group, even back in the early days of newborn intensive care, pointed out how important babies being with their mothers was and, and that separating them was not biologically normal or beneficial to babies. This is a graphic that kind of demonstrates that throughout the ages, babies being with their mothers has been the norm. And even today, in areas outside of our very industrialized nations, this is still the norm, that babies are with their mothers from the time of birth. And 
the family and if needed uh, the community come around to support them but baby and mother together is uh, biologically what is expected by everyone. When we developed newborn intensive care units we inserted a whole bunch of technology between the baby and their family and us. We were there to kind of mine the technology more than the babies. We did have some contact with the babies but really kids spent most of their time in direct contact with these inanimate objects and we had a little bit of contact in families maybe we allowed to visit for 15 minutes a day if they put on gowns and gloves and masks. We got better at that and developed family-centered care, but even in the best family-centered care units, babies still spend most of their time in direct contact with inanimate objects, with the inert incubator, not with human beings. So we need to get back to a point where the baby in direct contact with another human being, preferably the mother, is the norm and the technology, and we are there to support that, and of course, there are some situations where we still have babies so critical that, that we'll need to have them um, in direct contact with technology more than with families. But most of the time that's not necessary and we need to design and operate our units with that in mind. We have a long way to go with that. Obviously in utero babies are in direct contact with their mothers 100% of the time. At the Stockholm unit, uh, the study that I will talk about in more detail in a minute, but at Karolinska, uh, they achieved a 70% duration of skin to skin. So most of the time, even when the moms were sleeping, babies were in direct contact with them. In the United States, we don't do so good. So on the far right there is a typical U.S. center about 1% of the time. This information is generated from a Vermont Oxford NICQ project where we had a number of highly motivated hospitals. They, they were putting the time in to come to NICQ they were going to do some work on improving kangaroo care, uh, but at their beginning stage, at their baseline, this is the data that they generated, that moms and babies were together about 1% of the time. With substantial efforts, they were able to triple that up to 3% of the time. Still not very much, right? But that's a major improvement. And remember, Dr. Cher's study showed that only six hours a week were enough to show improved maturation on EEG, and that's about your 3%. So even with some relatively minor changes, we can get real benefits for babies. So now I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the data that we've generated with uh, specific sensory environments. Again, the, the amount of data out there is huge, so I can only talk about a couple of relatively small areas just to give you a flavor of of how much data is there and how important it is to be thinking about this. I'll start with auditory development because this is the part of the brain that is in the most active stage of development in the third trimester. The sensory, the touch, the movement, areas of the brain are already pretty well developed by the end of the second trimester and the visual area is not going to undergo its major growth until after term delivery when one would have expected the eyes to begin to get some external stimuli. So it's the auditory environment that's really growing in the third trimester. In utero, babies get a great deal of auditory stimuli. Most of it is in the low frequency ranges because what they get is coming through the mother's body and the amniotic fluid, a liquid and a solid environment as opposed to the air-filled environment that we get our auditory stimuli through. So it's a different frequency and it's different sorts of sounds, although it certainly includes mother's voice. We know that the auditory cortex is in this critical, important phase of development in the third trimester, and we know that fetuses learn to recognize sounds. After birth, within the first day after birth, it's been demonstrated that babies recognize their mother's voice, singing a lullaby, saying a poem, distinct from any other woman or man, um, reading that same poem or singing that same lullaby. So this is a very important stage of development for babies. In the newborn intensive care unit, it's very different. So first, the sounds come to babies through a different environment, through an air-filled environment. There's this vast cacophony of sounds, human sounds, ventilator sounds, all of the technology. This is all coming to babies. These are unfamiliar, and they're presented in an unfamiliar way. 
often there is a multi-sensory input. So when we come to the incubator to do something for a baby, to draw blood work, to suction, we'll say some words that we hope are calming for babies, but then we follow it frequently with something that's not very pleasant for the infant. So the infant gets this association of our voices with unpleasant stimuli. This is very different, obviously, from how it occurs in utero. And then we often will do this in the middle of a sleep phase. Babies, as we all know, spend most of their time sleeping. And so whether we're aware that they're sleeping or whether we just don't have a choice, we often interrupt the sleep phase and um, our stimuli, auditory stimuli in particular, are happening at a time which is less optimal for the infants than we would desire. Here's a study way back in 1980 that demonstrated how the impact of an auditory environment can be harmful for babies. So in the top line you see heart rate, second line is the auditory stimulus. In this sound level, uh, baseline in this unit was in the mid 50s, which was typical for the NICUs back in those days, which were relatively quiet compared to our busy, loud units uh, that are pretty typical for the 80s and 90s, that were built in the 80s and 90s. So the sound stimulus goes to 75 or 80 decibels the first two times. The third time it goes up to about 90 decibels. And for frame of reference, 90 decibels is about the sound of a full-term baby crying. So these aren't terribly loud sounds, but they're presented to this infant on three separate occasions. And you will see on the top slide and the top bar that the baby's heart rate accelerates with each of those noises, but not enough that we'd really notice. In the middle, you see the respiratory rate. Again, there's some change in that, but again, I think we probably wouldn't notice that as we were paying attention to the baby or the baby's monitor. The next line is a transcutaneous oxygen monitor. That's what we had back in those days before saturation monitors. And you'll see that the first two times, there's a big dip in the oxygenation. But then the third time, the baby seems like maybe they habituated because their oxygen doesn't drop again. But if you look at the bottom line, this is a transcutaneous intracranial pressure transducer. Back in those days, we had a transducer that would fit over the anterior fontanelle and would tell us, not totally accurately, but general idea of what intracranial pressure was. And normal intracranial pressure in babies, because their fontanelles and sutures are open, tends to run around zero. But with each of these noises, you will see that the baby's pressure goes up to 20 or 30 uh, millimeters of mercury, which doesn't habituate, even with that third noise uh, stimulus, the baby's intracranial pressure goes up again. If you think in small preemies, 23, 24, 25 weekers, what their mean arterial blood pressure is, and realize that that's in the low 20s with many of these kids, you can imagine that if intracranial pressure rises to that same level in the low 20s, that you can interrupt blood flow through the capillaries during the period of this noise stimulus. So if we had this kind of window into babies' brains now and could see the way the stimuli that we're presenting to babies have an adverse immediate impact on their brains, I think we'd be much more sensitized to provide better environments for our babies. Let me shift now to lighting. And I'm just going to talk about circadian rhythms. It's an area that I'm interested in. Um, it's not the most important by any means, but I use it because it demonstrates the complexity of this topic, of this sensory environment in the newborn ICU and how much we've learned and how much we have yet to learn. So we know that in utero, babies have multiple circadian rhythms that are established by the third trimester. Heart rate, temperature, activity levels, and several of their body hormones, and that these are triggered by maternal cues, both hormones that come across the placenta and also the mother's own activity and body temperature changes. We know that the neuronal connections that allow us to tell day and night are intact in the fetus by 28 to 32 weeks. So the retinohypothalamic tract, the RHT, is the nerves that carry information from the retina to the hypothalamus. And then the suprachiasmatic nuclei 
collect this information and that's where our body clock is located. And those are intact and functioning by 28 to 32 weeks. So a fair question would be, once a baby is delivered and doesn't get any more circadian information from the mother, is this light stimulus, day-night cycling, the best zeitgeber or timekeeper for babies? It's the normal one for us as adults and for kids. Is it also the appropriate one for babies? The first study to explore this was, again, done back in the 80s. So I think you'll see from both of these old slides that a lot of this isn't new information. This study was done in a British unit where they had two step-down areas. So these were more stable babies. And both of those areas at the time were lit 24 hours a day, were pretty noisy. That was pretty typical for all of us. What they decided to do was turn the lights off and turn the radio off in one of these rooms at night, leave the other as their control environment. And they examined a number of things on these babies at the time of discharge and then again at uh, the expected date of delivery and an expected date of delivery plus 12 weeks. And you'll see on the slide the closed dark circles are the babies who were in the dark room at night. The open are the control babies. And this slide shows the number of hours awake. So at the time of discharge, there's no difference between the two groups. But when you get to their expected date of delivery, the babies who were in the room that was dark at night spend less time awake every day, or conversely, sleep more uh, per day than the babies are in the room that was kept bright at night. And this difference doesn't get better as time goes on, even though they're farther and farther away from that experience, the difference actually becomes more exaggerated as time goes on. And we know that the things we do to babies have a lifelong impact. I don't think we realize so much that even these environmental factors may have a lifelong impact. There are a couple of other studies reported just in this month's July pediatrics uh, issue that show that this information is still uh, valid, that um, other studies have now been done in premature babies that show if you keep them in a day-night environment at home, they do better, they sleep better, they're less fussy uh, than babies who are kept in a continuously dim environment at home. And another study that shows that low birth weight infants, when studied many years later, have blunted circadian rhythms um, compared to full-term babies. So this impact is lifelong, and it is one that we can influence in our newborn intensive care units. Well, the obvious question for this study was, um, they manipulated two variables, lighting and sound. So which of them was really the important one? And the second question that could be asked was, well, these are step-down babies, and so maybe lighting is important to them, but how about those really sick kids? Lighting probably isn't nearly as important for them, right? So we did the next study uh, in the late 80s, and we did it in our newborn intensive care unit where the design was two intensive care rooms, 10 babies per room. There are mirror images. They were designed as a clinical laboratory so we could do this kind of study. Mirror images of one another, so the physical environment was exactly the same. Same nurses, same doctors. Proximity to all the other support services was exactly the same. The only variable was turning the lights off at night in one of the rooms and keeping them on in the other. And we had the same findings. Babies gained weight better. They got out of the hospital sooner. They had better scores on the motor cluster of their Brazelton exam. Subsequent to our study, a number of other studies demonstrated the same thing, that cycled lighting was better than continuous bright lighting for babies, and that the impact was as great or greater the sicker the baby was. It wasn't just something for step-down babies. Well, the next step in the thinking was, well, duh, of course, turning the lights off is good for babies, and um, maybe we should turn them off all the time because in utero, babies are in a continuous dim environment. And in fact, the NIDCAP training, intense developmental care training at that time, was to give babies continuous dim lighting. 
I didn't think that was a good idea because of this whole circadian question and, and this was the only circadian information babies were going to get. And indeed, subsequent studies that compared continuous dim lighting to a day-night cycle have shown that babies do better with cycled lighting than continuous dim lighting as well. So this is pretty well established, that babies benefit from cycled lighting. So what we know about circadian rhythms for babies is that they do have the biological ability to respond to light at least by 32 weeks, maybe a little sooner. We know that they are exposed to and entrained to circadian rhythms in utero. We know that daylight, day-night cycling is better than either continuous bright or continuous dim lighting. We know that exposing babies to some degree of light is not harmful. So we can conclude that day-night cycling is important, at least for kids once they get past that 28 to 32 week gestation point. But there are still some lingering questions. What about babies less than 28 weeks who don't have the neurological capability to respond to light? Their retinas are not far enough developed to carry that information to the brain. And we notice that even though babies do better in a cycled lighting environment, they don't seem to actually have a circadian rhythm themselves. They have these ultradian rhythms, the feeding rhythms of every hour and a half or two hours, but they don't have circadian rhythms. One of the explanations could be that we obliterate those. I talked about this with an incubator, that even if a baby tried to have a circadian rhythm in body temperature, we'd never see it because we serve and control their temperatures. But I wondered whether there might be other circadian stimuli that babies were meant to receive. And one of them that came to mind right away was the issue of mother's milk. We knew at the time that there were differences in mother's milk between milk expressed during the daytime and at night, differences in protein and calcium and phosphorus concentration, among other things. It also turns out that, at least at term, mothers have milk that's differing in concentrations of melatonin and cortisol when compared between daytime and nighttime milk that's been expressed. So we asked whether that might be true for premature babies as well. So here's that data. This was milk expressed by mothers who had delivered their babies prematurely, and we took samples and measured both melatonin and cortisol. So this time scale starts at 6 p.m., goes through the night and then through the rest of the next day. Melatonin is the blue squares. And as is true in our own bodies, melatonin's at a very low level until you get to the evening. Typically this is an hour or two before sunset when melatonin begins to rise and it reaches a relatively high level during the night, plateaus, and then falls again at the beginning of the day. Cortisol follows a similar but more dramatic circadian rhythm where it's relatively low uh, through most of the night and then we get this wake up spike around four o'clock in the morning and then it gradually declines through the rest of the day. It looks like both of these hormones are passively transferred into the breast milk. So these levels are somewhat lower in the breast milk than they are in mother's blood but they reflect what's going on in the mother's serum. So the cortisol levels, which are shown in the gold triangles, you will see the, the highest level there, the outlier, was from a mother whose baby was very ill, ended up dying the next day. She was under a lot of stress. And this cortisol that was high in her own blood was also being transmitted to her baby. So we're getting circadian information passed from mother to baby through breast milk by hormones and probably more than circadian information, but even information about stresses that the mother is undergoing. So let me summarize this segment of what we know today about the sensory environment for babies, preemies in particular. We know that infants of every mammalian species that have been studied suffer from lack of extensive intimate contact with their mothers. We know that skin-to-skin -skin care has been shown to be efficacious in every environment it's been studied in. So we can't say, well, we're different from those places because it was started in Colombia and it's been tested in extensively in Africa and, and our society is different than that. Or it's been studied in 
Stockholm and their society is different from ours. No, even in Cleveland, uh, the data shows that skin-to-skin -skin care is beneficial to babies. We know that most of our NICUs were built without the benefit of this information. We just didn't have it um, back in the 80s and 90s when most of our units were being built. But we also know that even today, now that we have this information, we still aren't operating most of our units the way we should if we gave full benefit to this information. And so that takes us to the next step, which is um, let's not just think about babies, let's start thinking about the adults who are in these units as well. Because whatever we design and however we operate, we have to do it for the benefit of the adults who are in that unit. So let's look at staff. We know the staff benefit from access to daylight during the day, to bright light at night. We know that night shift workers get sleepy and that this can affect the accuracy and safety of their work and that exposure to a bright light will suppress melatonin levels and make them more alert. We know that noise is, um, is a dissatisfier for staff and can interfere with um, good safe procedures. We know that staff enjoy the ability to collaborate and socialize and we all like to be able to control our environments and we're all a little different so we don't all like exactly the same environment. These are things we already know about the best environment for staff. Let me just take one of these issues and, and I'll take circadian rhythm again just to show about the complexity of this issue. We know that bright light at night does improve body temperature, alertness, and performance. And this is not just in healthcare workers. It's been shown in long distance truckers, in nuclear power plant operators, in air traffic controllers, people we want to make sure they stay awake and, and don't make mistakes at night. But we also know that these night shift workers are more prone to a variety of cancers, as well as heart disease, hypertension, metabolic syndrome. This is a very complex issue. Although there are possible causes of this other than suppression of melatonin, we, we have to think twice about saying, well, the solution is just let's give bright lights for the staff and low lights for the babies and figure out a way to do that. We don't even know what the best lighting situation is for staff. We know we have a problem. And we have to think about that and plan for it when we're building a unit that's going to be in existence for the next 25 or 30 years. This is a slide just to demonstrate the issue with, with uh, night shift workers. So the top diagram is um, lighting, that's in the blue, and that's a logarithmic scale, and activity is in the black. And for a day shift worker, that's pretty rhythmic. That's a pretty good um, day-night rhythm throughout the week, even on the weekends. For a night shift worker, you can see how disrupted that is. And you can imagine that that would have health benefits. So this is our challenge. How do we make this environment healthier for not only the babies, but also for the people who work there? One of the things that we need to think about, not only for babies, but also for caregivers and families, is this whole issue of sleep deprivation. Night shift workers, most of them are working as sleep deprived individuals because they don't live at night all the time. They work at night and then they go home and, and sleep when they can and, and then they have families and they try to live normal day lives for the most part uh, even though they work at night. So they're in a constant state of some degree of sleep deprivation. Babies are of course and families are too uh, even when we try to provide them the best facilities. So this is an issue, again, that we have to consider and, and think more about it as we're building our units. Sleep is a crucial time for babies. It not only is a time of consolidating memories, but as I pointed out, a time when actual learning also occurs. And we don't do a very good job of protecting that for babies. I guess the way to summarize this area is to point out that much of this data isn't anything that you would have read in the medical journals that you follow. It comes in a variety of different disciplines, sociology, anthropology, psychology, occupational health, in addition to medicine, are all areas that inform what we should be doing in both the design and operation of our units, not only for babies, 
but also for the adults that live and work there. So when we go back to these working premises, we have to conclude that good NICU design requires that we design space specifically for the needs of babies, but also for the needs of their parents and for our caregivers. We have to design with each of those constituencies in mind. And that brings us to individualized environments. And the prototype for an individualized environment is the single family room. We know that private rooms are now the standard in every other area of hospitals in the United States. This is the code requirement that in the United States, every other part of the hospital, other than the newborn ICU, has to have private rooms in any new construction or major renovation. And they are growing trends as well in newborn ICUs, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. But are they a good idea for an ICU? Because there could be hazards. There certainly are pitfalls. You can do private rooms and get it wrong and be worse off than with, uh, uh, with our old units. So let's look at some of the important factors for single family room design. Here's the rationale for babies. We can provide for each baby their optimal individualized environment. Lighting and sound control, they're not gonna be disturbed by what's going on at the baby's next bed. Infection control, we can control the amount of exposure they have to what's going on elsewhere in the unit. And we know that skin-to-skin -skin contact has important biological benefits for babies, and that at least in our Western society, mothers are more likely to do this when they have some privacy. It's also the optimal environment for families. It gives them privacy for interaction with their babies. You don't see many dads singing lullabies to their babies in a big open room. Uh, it gives privacy for interaction with the medical staff, and I've got some data with respect to that. And it gives families a sense of control and belonging that they don't have when they're in a big open space. It's even better for caregivers because it allows some nursing functions to be removed from the infant care area. If nurses have to be on stage all the time next to their babies, not only is that stressful, but it also prevents us from designing environments that might be more suitable for their needs for at least some of the time when they're working. So we know there are many adult and pediatric units that have shown this concept is feasible and there are now many NICUs as well that have shown that it's practical. But we have learned about some pitfalls and we want to explore um, what makes good NICU design. Here's a, a brief listing of um, single family room designs throughout the world. Um, whether you are in Europe, Canada, or the United States, you can find a unit that has single family room design to give you some general idea of how that fits in with that particular society and culture. Let's look at some of the data that have demonstrated the benefits of single family room. This first study is the one I alluded to from Karolinska in Stockholm. And what they did in that unit was, at the time that they were gonna switch over from an open design to single family room, they decided halfway through to do this study. Their unit was on two floors, so they renovated one floor to go to all single family room and left the other floor with the old open design. Same doctors, same nurses, same social milieu, which was that in Sweden, families can be with their babies extensively because they have extended family leave. What they did then was randomly assign families to be either in the single family room or in the open unit design. And what they found is that particularly with the very low birth weight babies, the babies less than 30 weeks gestation, there's a dramatic improvement. Parents did stay, as I showed you in the slide on the degree of skin-to-skin -skin care that occurred, families stayed and spent extended periods of time in contact with their babies. They were able to stay during the day and did so even in the open unit, but there wasn't a place for them to stay at night with their babies in the open unit. There was in the single family room. This was the major difference between those two units. And what you saw was this dramatic reduction in time spent in intensive care, 10 days, and a reduction in chronic lung disease. You'll see that their BPD rate is very low. Part of this is because it's Sweden and their babies tend to do better. Part of it also is 
this unit takes only babies up to CPAP. They don't do ventilator care. That's transferred to another um, Karolinska unit. So their incidence of BPD is lower than a unit that would have also ventilator care babies. But even with that very low incidence to start with, they were able to show a further dramatic improvement just by providing space for families to stay and be with their babies. Here's a study from the United States. This is a historical control. So this was a unit where they were in an open design and then moved to private rooms and used the historical controls for their study. These were older babies too. Mean gestational age was about 34 weeks, moderate severity of illness. But even, again, not with the most critical babies, they were able to show benefit marked reduction in apnea, increase in um, days on maternal breast milk, and reduction in the amount of time on total parental nutrition, and even a reduction in sepsis, although they weren't able to show statistical significance for that with the way the study was done. And then that bottom LEQ is a measure of noise, and you can see a marked reduction in sound levels in that unit as well. Let's go from babies to families and talk about how they benefit from single family rooms. This data is from Dennis Stevens unit in South Dakota. This is a, a model of one of their single family rooms. So this was a survey that was done for families. Uh, again, using historical controls, they did the survey before and then um, after they moved to the new unit, after a, a leaving a honeymoon period in there, so that what they're really reviewing is, is a true finding of families, not just the initial excitement about moving to a new unit. And they found that the new unit families felt was much friendlier to them, but they also, families seem to think that staff worked better together, that the care their baby was given was better. Um, the staff didn't think they were any different. They thought they were giving the same care, and they probably were. But the perspective of families was that this was even better. Subsequently, Dr. Stevens has shown in an article that's going to be published um, in a, another month or two in the HERD journal, the Health Environments Research Design Journal, that a 15% reduction in overall cost was achieved after moving to the uh, single family room environment. So this is not only nice for families, but it's also cost effective. At Vanderbilt, they had a concurrent control study, so they renovated part of their area, so they had single family rooms in some areas and uh, open bay in other areas. And they talked to families, they did survey of families who had had their babies in both spaces. So these families had experienced both areas and these families too felt like the care their baby was given was better and the environment was better for them. They felt they had better access to doctors and that the doctors actually spent more time talking to them um, in the private rooms. This was kind of a virtuous cycle because doctors found that families were more likely to be present in the private rooms and so they spent more time actually talking to the families. So you had this positive uh, benefit going back and forth that families knew that they could spend time with the doctors and instead of it being a very cursory, hi, how are you, your baby is doing okay, kind of conversation. They could have much more in-depth conversations when families were in private rooms. The privacy is a double-edged sword. So it definitely provides a benefit to families and babies. And we are indeed mandated to provide that. We must give families information in private so that it isn't shared with everybody else in the unit. But Privacy can also cause isolation, not only for families, but also for nurses. If you don't design your unit in such a way that there are areas where families can gather and support one another and where nurses can collaborate, then you will have some unhappy families and staff members. So here's a slide that, that demonstrates that factor. This is St. Paul Children's, and on the right is the infant care room. On the left is the corridor, and you will see that there are nurse stations outside each two patient rooms. So nurses have a place where they can work and chart immediately outside the baby's room. That's good in a way. The problem was that it didn't provide any space where nurses could gather together more than one or two of them. 
And you'll see in the survey that we show on the next slide that that was a dissatisfier for staff. So when you interviewed staff at St. Paul Children's, here's what they thought. They thought the rooms were better for the babies. They even thought it was better for them. Their work environment was improved. And they even thought their quality of life off the job was improved. So again, kind of saying even for staff, it's not just a place where you work and then you go home and, and you leave it behind. Where you work has an impact on you all day long throughout your life. But as you see in that last bullet, they also felt that the open bay was better for them than the private rooms for their ability to collaborate with their colleagues. But that's not inherent to a private room design. That's just because that's the way that unit was designed. It didn't provide a space for staff to collaborate with each other, not only on a work level, but just when they had a few extra minutes to talk about their kid's soccer game or what they were going to do this weekend. That's something that people need as well. It needs to be part of their work environment. So this slide summarizes um, the studies that I've alluded to and includes one more uh, from Dr. Pineda in St. Louis. It, it's actually shown there on the slide as Journal of Perinatology um, 2011 and unpublished. The uh, subsequent study has now been published in Journal of Perinatology in July of 2012. And what they showed was that in private room design, parents would come spend more time with their babies, and you'd think that was a good thing. But because they did not have any space or have a culture that encouraged parents to stay overnight, parents ended up having more stress. They couldn't stay with their babies. They got bonded with their babies. They wanted to be with their babies, but then they weren't allowed to stay overnight. And the babies suffered in this environment too. They found that babies who were in the private rooms had lower uh, vocal development scores later on in infancy. And I think this is because the babies, if their parents weren't there, they had no human contact. They were in this room all by themselves instead of being out in an open room where at least they heard human voices and babies crying, they, they had other sound stimuli that we took them away from when we put them in a private room and then didn't let their parents stay with them. So here's a summary of the arguments that have been mounted for and against single family rooms. There's clearly this science that the neural development of preemies demands that they have an appropriate sensory environment. There's the business case, not only family satisfaction at this point, but also studies that have shown a reduced length of stay, especially the Karolinska study, um, but also the savings that were shown at Dennis Stevens' unit in South Dakota. And then we have just the issue of patient rights, that families and their babies do have a right to privacy. Against that are the staff's concerns for the well-being of babies. And every unit that's moved from an open to a single family room unit, staff have been concerned, will we be able to take care of our babies? Will we know when they're getting into trouble? Will we be able to respond to those things in time? And we know now from dozens of units that have done this that that is not a safety issue. Administrators have an issue about cost and, and space. And historically, NICUs have been stuck in a small part of the hospital, not given nearly as much space, even though room rates are the same for intensive care for a baby as they are for an adult, room space is not. And our argument is, number one, it's cost effective because we can reduce length of stay and improve outcomes if we give babies private rooms. But number two, babies have this right. This is the most crucial stage of life, to have this appropriate environment Nobody else in the hospital deserves it more than our babies. Here's just a few slides that we'll run through pretty quickly to show you some design features um, to think about when you're designing a newborn intensive care unit with private rooms. This unit from Oklahoma Children's was actually an adult unit. Um, they couldn't even get their own new unit. They had to um, get hand-me-downs from the adults, but it's a nice unit. The private rooms are arranged around the perimeter and what they've done with that central area, you see off to the left, the nurses station. So there is an area for nurses to gather together in private and, and do work that needs to be done, uh, not in the presence of families. But then there's this beautiful area in the center where staff and families can, can meet together. 
families can eat their lunch there. It's a co-mingling area that really emphasizes the idea that we are a team. It's not the medical team and the family, but the families are part of the team as well, and that we can all work together, and then, as needed, we'll go together into the baby's room and provide care to the baby, or individually as the baby's care and as the family desires. Here's another demonstration of just taking a little bit of space at the end of a hallway with a window. Des Moines um, Blank Children's Hospital did this as a space where families could gather. When families are in private rooms, they don't want to leave that and go outside of the unit to a family lounge waiting area that's far away from where their baby is. They may want to just leave the unit to get a cup of coffee. They may want to leave the, the, the baby's room for just a few minutes while the nurses are starting an IV. They may want to, their baby's sleeping and they may just want to go out and, and be next to a window for a little bit but be nearby so when the doctor comes to round on the baby, they're right there, they, they know about it, they can come right back into the room. So providing these little spaces for families nearby the patient room is a very good way of helping families um, enjoy the, pri the benefits of the private room, but also um, not be isolated in them. These next two slides demonstrate just the benefit of daylight, and I can't count the number of designs where people have built areas and ended up giving the windows to even storage space, let alone um, areas that don't get used very much. A conference room, for example, uh, that doesn't get used very much in, in the course of the day, and all of these valuable windows are, are dedicated to that space. So here's at Meritor Hospital in, in Madison, Wisconsin, here's a view of the lounge from one direction, and then the next slide will show you a view from the other direction, and I want you to contrast how this room feels with these two slides. So there's the difference that a window makes. Exactly the same room, just shown from a different perspective. Having windows is really important for us as adults, and a design needs to make sure that the space that adults spend a lot of their time in has that window. It's very important to our psyche and to our health as well. Just little spaces that incorporate nature. This was built on a deck. Um, they didn't have room down on the ground in this hospital. It's in the middle of a big city. Uh, but they found some space on a roof deck to give families and staff a space that they could get outside and get a little bit of contact with nature. It makes a big difference. For those of you who are interested in design specifically going forward, Here's a slide that has some additional elements. I think all of us are, are gonna understand the need for greater use of daylight, natural materials, reducing the use of electricity and water, making our, our designs um, greener. Electronic communications are changing our world and, and we need to anticipate 20 years in advance, as best as we can, how they'll change how we communicate with each other and with families and with the information we get from babies. We're gonna have monitors, I'm sure, in the next 20 years that give us a multitude of information transcutaneously or maybe invasively, but, but mostly non-invasively from babies that right now we can only get from coming and seeing the baby or, or drawing lab work. We've already seen this change happen dramatically from a point in the 1980s where the only way we could tell if a baby was oxygenating well enough was to look at them or draw a blood gas, and, and now we rely totally on our monitors to tell us that information. Much more information is gonna be given to us like that. And I think especially from the brain, we're gonna be able to get this window into the brain so that we know minute to minute how things that we're doing to babies or not doing to babies that we should be are having an impact on the brain. I wanna make this point to anyone who's designing a new unit. Please understand how important design is for us as spiritual beings. Artists and architects understand this, or I should say many architects understand this, but you can find an architect who will build you a big square unit if that's what you want and lose the impact that size, having high ceilings, daylight, access to nature, curved and uh, natural surfaces like wood. Um, these all seem like little things and yet you can tell instantly when you look at a hospital and a hotel. 
they're much different because people who design hotels understand that people feel better, that they're more likely to come to their hotel if they use these natural surfaces, if they use this grand design, than if we put them in little boxes. And yet we put babies and ourselves in little boxes in NICUs all the time and don't even consider how important these are to our spirits. So here's a visual for that. On the left is Women and Infants Hospital in Rhode Island recently before they built their new unit. And many of you will be familiar with this uh, from units that you work in or where your baby is right now. You can't even find a baby in this picture. But when you look on the right, the central point in the picture, the central point in the design is the baby and the mother. And everything else is designed around that. And you have daylight, you have wood grain surfaces, you have a much different feeling. So neuroprotection is a big topic now. So let's put this in that context. What are the neuroprotective elements of the environment that we should be emphasizing and enhancing? First off, we know that access to normal flora is good. Pathogens cause the body to release a number of substances that have an adverse impact on the brain, the white matter in particular. We know that mother's milk has many substances in it that are beneficial to baby's brain development. We know that appropriate sensory stimuli are important to babies for their development. And we know that extended intimate contact, skin to skin with mothers, is beneficial. And the cool thing about this is that if you put the baby skin to skin with their mothers, it makes all the rest of those better. It gives the babies access to normal flora, to probiotics from the mother. It enhances her ability to produce breast milk. It obviously gives the baby more appropriate stimuli than they would get in an incubator. So this is a virtuous cycle again that we can produce simply by making it possible for babies to spend time with their mothers skin to skin. So single family rooms are a mean to an end. They're a great design feature, but you don't have to have them to do important things for babies. And certainly if you do do them and you don't give babies the chance to be with their mothers for extended periods of time, this is the lesson that they learned in St. Louis, that just building single family rooms doesn't automatically give you better outcomes. You have to give the babies extended intimate contact with their mothers to get that benefit. So here's the visual for that. This is neuroprotection the way we should be giving it for babies in our newborn intensive care units. And we can do this whether you have a new unit or an old unit. We can do this better than we have. I want to use an analogy that I think will ring true for you. Back when I started in the 70s, we loved formula. Breast milk was kind of sloppy. It was hard to sterilize. You, you had to store it. And we knew it wasn't optimal for preemies. It didn't have enough protein or calcium or phosphorus or iron or any of the other things that, that we knew preemies needed better than what we could give them with breast milk. So we had formulas. It was sterile. We could give exactly the amounts we wanted. Storage was no problem. We could make the recipe anything we wanted and make it what we thought was better for babies than with breast milk. We obviously don't think that way anymore. We know that breast milk has many things in it that we can never replicate with formula. And we can make breast milk, um, we can add fortifiers and use it in a way that makes it the best nutrition possible for babies. We're kind of in that same stage of the 1970s with formula, with incubators right now. Today, we think of them as places that are warm and secure for babies, whereas putting babies in mother's arms is kind of risky and a big hassle for us. I think where we're going is to realize that incubators are these inert places that are devoid of human contact for babies. And we will only put babies there if we don't have any other choice, or if the babies are simply so sick or their mothers simply aren't available. But every chance possible, we will put babies in human contact. This is where I think we're headed. We've already gotten there with breast milk. We need to get there with human contact for babies. So here's the elevator speech. You get the chance with your administrator for 15 seconds in the elevator. And you need to tell them why you need a new NICU. Here's the story. Nowhere in the hospital is as important as the newborn ICU. This is a crucial period of brain development for our babies. And nobody needs their family more 
the space for their family to be with the baby than in the newborn ICU. There are great things happening everywhere in the hospital. It's true, lives are being saved everywhere. But only in the newborn ICU are we building brains for a lifetime and we're building families for a lifetime and we have to have the space to do that right. Here are some resources. The Gravens Conference is a place where a lot of this research is presented. We have tracks on developmental care, on NICU design, and on family-centered care. So you get it all together in the Gravens Conference and the most recent data is always going to be presented there. There also are supplements to the Journal of Perinatology in 2007 that show the recommended standards as well as a number of ancillary articles that provided a lot of support information for those recommended standards. The new recommended standards are going to be out shortly and will be in a supplement to the Journal of Perinatology either at the end of 2012 or beginning of 2013. There are also issues of clinics in perinatology that contain much of this data, much more of this data actually of the sensory environment. In 2004, we looked at each of the, the sensory areas auditory, visual, touch, smell, etc. Um, in depth in animal and human studies and then looked at the NICU design implications for each of those. And a subsequent issue came out in 2011 that looked in even greater depth with much more data now available at the sensory environment of the newborn ICU.